what happened while we were there, we served around 450 people with medical assistance. They got a doctor's appointment, they got to see a nurse, and they got medication. 450 people for free uh, that were able to help there in the Dominican Republic in a city called Puerto Plata. Um, while we were there, our group, our team preached in about five different churches. I was able to preach uh, in a church on Saturday night that we had uh, gone and helped this community. We had people coming in. And then I preached on Sunday morning uh, as well. Um, now, our team did some amazing things. Let me just kind of look around. This is one of the churches where we were doing the service. That's me speaking in one of the churches there in Puerto Plata. Uh, this is another church in a rural community that we're serving people there medically. And here's my little buddy that I found while I was down there. Uh, and uh, then Jose uh, with another woman from our team and this woman there that we served. Jose actually got asked to preach while he was there. That was fantastic. This is another church that we're serving the, the people medically there. We got to speak to all the people that came in and share the gospel with them. And uh, here's uh, Kayla and Shandrika. They're uh, working. And uh, this man, got Jose, and then Jose Raphael and his wife, who's a, um, a pediatrician, she served there as well. This is our bus driver. This is the team that... Uh, the whole team that uh, was with us there. And you can see, uh, this is just one of the locations. There's a lot of medication there. Um, and uh, I will say that uh, Shandrika, and uh, this is one of the, the churches we were in, uh, but Shandrika and Kayla, Dominican Walmart. All right, I want you to see that. That is, uh, well, these guys, they kind of took charge while we were down there. And uh, they were... Uh, they were awesome. They really, really were awesome. And, and so um, I'm going to ask Jose, if he will, to come to the stage. Um, I'm, I know Kayla is serving back uh, in our kids' ministry today. Uh, is Shandrika here? Shandrika, would you come up too? All right. And so um, I know Kayla, and let me grab this mic here. Uh, but Kayla's serving back in the back. And what we're going to do. Um, I'm going to ask them to give you a little bit of their perspective of what this trip meant. I'm going to start with Shandrika. And uh, what you may not know about her, she's been coming to our church now for what, 17, 18 years now. Is that right? And uh, Shandrika's a nurse. She's, she's a family nurse practitioner. She's getting her master's degree from University of Alabama. Uh, it's hard for me to say that. Uh, but no, it, it is a wonderful uh, institution there. Uh, but he, here's what I'm going to say. I was so proud of you watching how you got involved and kind of took charge. I didn't know she was a take charge kind of person, but she just kind of took over, all right, and said, this is the way it's going to be. Why don't you tell us, what did this trip mean to you, and do you recommend that people go on a trip like this? I do. I recommend that... Um step outside of your environment. Um, the community was very well impoverished, so it was an eye-open experience. Um, and just being grateful for just clean water. Is, yeah. Um, we, we didn't know this, but we couldn't drink the water at the place where we stayed. They told us not even to brush our teeth or that we would uh, regret it. I won't, that's all I'll say. Uh, and so, but yeah, it was, it was something, wasn't it? Yeah to serve. Um, I've been wanting to serve in this community um, as well, but that was a great opportunity as well, so I'm, I'm grateful for that. Yeah, and uh, so what would you do as far as challenging our people? Like, we want to do this again next year. Uh, would you recommend people go on this? Oh, absolutely. It was, it was good. It was good as far as my relationship with God. It made me think. Yeah. Rethink my relationship and my calling. Yeah. So when you got there, uh, it did more for you than you expected. It did. It did. Yes. And, and, and here's the interesting thing. When you went down there, you were going down there to help them, but this whole experience helped you. Absolutely. 
And Absolutely. So, well, let's give Shandrika a hand. I'm so uh, proud of her. And then Jose, um, this, is, this is so wonderful. Uh, on Saturday night, uh, they were uh, telling us who was going to preach. There were several preachers that were on this trip. And they were saying, uh, you're going to speak in this church, and you're going to speak in this church, and this is going to be your interpreter. Uh, and Jose, who is fluent in Spanish, he actually lived in the Dominican Republic for 19 years. Is that right? And uh, Angela's from there. And uh, so, obviously, he's very familiar. And Jose thought he was going to interpret for me. That's kind of what I thought was going to happen as well. But he's going around, and he said, and Jose, you're going to preach in this church. And you saw that picture there a moment ago, and they started calling him Pastor Jose. All right, so, and, uh, but Jose, tell us what that meant to you and uh, how that made you feel. It, you were shocked when they asked you to preach. Uh, yeah, I was, like, frightened. I'm like, I'm not a preacher. You know, I mean, I, I can speak in public. That don't bother me. I teach, have taught for a living, but not a big deal. But then he said, you're going to preach. And I'm like, we're gone. You know, in my mind is, well, it was pretty cool because at first I thought I was in a room with this guy. You know, <laughs> I thought we were going to bunk together, but we didn't. They gave us rooms, separate rooms, which is great. And, but I'm like, yeah, I'm, I'm going to be able to translate for Pastor Richie, and it's going to be really great. We're going to have a good time. He went to Genesis Church. I yes. Think. Yeah. Uh, he was at Genesis Church, and I was at the... Uh, the Baptist pastor's name was yeah. Roberto Duran. Robert for those Durant, of you yeah. that remember the boxer, that yeah. was not him, but his name is Roberto Duran. Yeah. In one of the churches that we went to visit, it's like uh, the, the one that I preached in, that's where we had one of the clinics, and they said, like, okay, uh, Jose, you're going to preach at the First Baptist Church of Montellano. I'm like, what? What are you talking about? You know? And, and I looked at Jose Rafael, the one that you saw there with his family with me, and it's like, Jose, you're crazy. And he said, no, you... And I'll be honest with you, I had a... We, we really became a family. And I think that's what's really good about all this is, uh, look, if you, and I'll echo what Shandrika says, it's an experience. You become a family. Uh, all these folks from different churches that were there had one from Brooklyn, New York, or the yep. Bronx. Was it Brooklyn or Bronx? No, uh, Brooklyn. Brooklyn, Brooklyn. Uh, and there's Jose pre uh, preaching in the church yeah, there. Let's Pastor, give him a hand. Pastor that Jose. <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, um, had George, and George came, and he knew, he saw my nervousness and all that, and got to love George. George was a really loud Puerto Rican from Brooklyn. <laughs> I'm like, oh my gosh, you know, we became so close, and we actually have stayed in touch, and that's the other thing. We have stayed in touch with all the people that went to this trip, and George said, he laid hands on me, and he says, I know that you're not an, an, an a uh, ordained preacher, let me ordain you right now. And, it, and he says, in the name of Jesus, I just declare that the Lord's going to give you the words that these people need to hear. I'm like, well, i got no choice now. <laughs> you know, I receive it. And I'll tell you what, uh, Shandrika, you remember the, uh, our trip to the church? We were in a Nissan pickup truck, a uh, crew cab, in the back. And in the back, we had Francis... We had Kayla, we had Shandrika, and we had me in this little Nissan pickup truck. And I got a text from my wife, because I was telling her, I sent her a picture of us, and she said, it's Cheita. And Cheita is the local, what the Dominicans call the local transport. It's the buses that they fill like 30 or 40 percent over capacity, you know? And uh, that's what she said, oh, you're in Cheita. I said, no, I'm in a pickup truck, you know? So uh, it was great, and I'll tell you what, and, and Richie, I'm just going to go and tell him, because I know you wanted me to say this. Um, folks, they're going back. I'm going back. I don't know how it's going to happen. I will probably be soliciting funds this time, because uh, I, I can't afford to go to the Dominican Republic on these things all, you know, on my pocket all the time, especially now that I'm retired. See the long hair? 
long beard. So, but anyway, um, I would encourage anybody that has the opportunity to go. I've always wanted to go on a mission trip. Never had the time because of the, you know, the work and, you know, all the other obligations. Well, you know what? Our obligation is to the Lord, plain and simple. That's our obligation is to Jesus Christ, and it's to spread the gospel to the ends of the earth. And I'll tell you what, next trip is going to be to an area called Bonao, and it's one of the areas where they have even Dominican missionaries serving smaller churches. So it's going to be a little more rural, you know, no resort. So don't be scared, but uh, we're going to stay in lesser hotels and all that. But I talked to Pastor Duran, who runs those medical missions down there, and Jose Rafael, and I'm like very comfortable. You know, it's a very agricultural community. Uh, it's in the middle of the island, and it's just going to be great. And if what we experienced in this trip repeats itself, it's well worth it. So, look, well, Jose, it's a medical mission. Hmm. You know, I could slap a Band-Aid on somebody, you know. I mean, that's no big deal. But uh, that's why we have folks like Shandrika in, in, in uh, uh, India and uh, Audrey who were, were certified nurses, and they came and helped the doctors. Jose was just a runner between the doctors and them. Like, here's a prescription. What does it say? I don't know. Hey, doctor, what did you write here? <laughs> Uh, so it kind of brought memories of my mom. She said, your handwriting's so bad, you should be a doctor, you know. I mean, like, oh, well. Uh, but look, it is well worth it. It's a heck of an experience, and you will grow. I grew not by the fact that George laid hands on me, and, and he prophesied over me, and he said, the Lord's going to use you greatly. And I'm like, okay, I accept it, you know. Uh, who shall I send? Here I am, Lord, you know. And uh, that's just the way. That's, that's what we got. Amen. Well, it was an amazing trip. And thank you, Jose. Let me say this. Uh, the, he's right. There were several doctors from the Dominican Republic that came out, volunteered their time, and helped us in these communities. And so if you would like to do something like this, get out of your comfort zone. That's one of the things that was said up here today. I really encourage you to do this. You say, well, I don't know if I can afford it. Well, you've got close to a year now to raise the money. And if God is able to provide our needs through prayer, through our work, he can provide for you to go on a trip like this. Do you believe that? How many believe that? Let's, let's see that, okay? Look, God can provide for you. And there are ways to raise the money through family and friends and things of that nature that I think everyone who would like to go, you should be able to go, all right? If you'll take the time, if you want to know, it cost us around $1,350 per person, and that covered food and everything. Now, you'll need a little extra money for spending money if that's what you'd like, but I really would encourage you uh, to go on something like this. I think it will change your life. One of the things I'm most proud of is how much our team grew spiritually. I, mean, I could literally see it with my own eyes. I was so excited at what God was doing in their heart. And you can even see in their life, in their commitment, in what they're doing now, how God is working in their life and growing them. And that, to me, is worth all of it, okay? That's, uh, that is an exciting thing. So... I hope you'll plan on going next year. I think it'll be something that you will fully enjoy, um, and I believe God will greatly use you. Well, speaking of that, just so you'll know, you say, well, what if I get down there and um, they ask me to testify in front of this group of people? Well, we always have uh, translators, so you don't have to worry about that. And you say, well, I'm not called to preach. Well, in the book of Acts, there's a story about a man named Philip. Now, Philip was a deacon. He was not a pastor. He was not a pastor at the church. But God was working in Jerusalem, and God told Philip to go out into the desert. He was to leave this big revival that was going on in Jerusalem 
And God had him going out. He didn't, didn't even know where he was going. I mean, it's one thing to say, all right, I want you to leave uh, Atlanta, Georgia, and go down to Jacksonville, Florida. Well, that's a plan that you know where it is. But God told him to go, and he would show him what to do. And you read in the book of Acts about how Philip met a man from Ethiopia. Uh, We refer to him as the Ethiopian eunuch. He was a political figure in the country of Ethiopia, probably a very powerful person. And he was reading from the book of Isaiah. And the Spirit of God worked through Philip, not a preacher. And he actually won this Ethiopian man to Christ and he baptized him. And biblical historians say that that man took the gospel to Ethiopia and a nationwide revival of people being saved broke out and the gospel permeated an entire country because of a man who was not a preacher, obeyed God. And so I can say with confidence, God can use you in ways that you can't even imagine if you're willing for him to use you. Just say, God, use me and mean it, and God will use you. I'm, I'm confident of that. Well, today we're going to continue the series we started uh, last week called Imago Day, and we're talking about the image of God. What does that mean? Uh, well, today we're going to talk about racism and prejudice Or how should we treat others? What does being made in the image of God require of Christians when it comes to treating other people? How should we treat them? How should we see them? Well, early in the service, we read in Psalm 133, verses 1 to 3. And I'm not going to preach from that text. But it does say how blessed it is for brothers and sisters to dwell together in unity. And it does say that... uh, There the Lord commands the blessing. And and I believe what it's talking about there, because it talks about the anointing oil that was put on Aaron's head, that anointing oil represents the fact that God wants to use you. And I really do believe this. God uses people and God uses churches who love Jesus and love each other and are unified in a common cause. I really believe that, and I believe that's what Scripture teaches. So um, let's read, and I'm not going to read the entire passage that I read last week, but I'm going to read selected portions from Genesis chapter 1, where God's creating mankind in his image, and here's what he said. Then God said, let us make mankind in our image. Once again, I believe the first reference to the Trinity uh, in the Bible, God the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit according to our likeness. So God created man in his own image. That word in Hebrew is mankind. He created mankind in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. It matters. You are a complement. You are made in the image of God. And, and we're going to talk about this in, um, in future weeks. And then it says, and God blessed them. This is very important. God blessed them. And God saw all that he had made. And behold, it was very good. Well, I want to just extract a couple principles, three to be exact, out of this text to show us how biblically we are to treat each other. What are we to do? How are we to treat other human beings? Well, here's the first point. The image of God requires us to honor one another, to honor one another. Is it just me or does it seem like that our culture is not very honoring nowadays? Boy, you can see a lot of dishonor. You can see a lot of tearing down. You don't see a lot of building up. You see a lot of vitriol and venom but you don't see a lot of blessing. And the truth is, in the book of James, uh, God tells us that with our tongue, we can be vicious and we can tear down. And he says, how is it that from the same tongue, 
that on one day we praise God and the other we curse our neighbor. So we're to honor one another. Every human life has great value. And human worth is not based on race, ethnicity, economic status, social standing, or physical attractiveness. Now, that's the way that the world looks at things. They look at the outward appearance, okay? And we often get really, really worried about the outward appearance, do we not? We get worried about those that we want to impress. We get worried about those that have a lot of money and we want to get them, maybe they'll let some of that rub off on us, right? But we are to honor one another. Honoring a person is not approval or acceptance of sin. Now, what do I mean by that? I believe we are to be honoring to everyone, even the people we disagree with. Even, listen, I'm going to get personal here. If you disagree with somebody politically, scripturally, we are to honor another person. And you don't have to agree with all the decisions. You don't have to support everything that they do. Uh, but even when it comes to people that are living a life that is diametrically opposed to how you believe and to what Scripture teaches, we are never to tear down, we are never to be dishonoring to another human being. Why is that? The truth is, every human ever made, ever born, was created in the image of God. You say, well, what about the really bad ones? Well, what about them? What about Hitler? Was he made in the image of God? Absolutely he was. Was he honoring to God? No. Uh, did he deserve uh, the place in history that he has? Of course he did, because he was an evil man, okay? But understand that um, because I'm made in the image of God, it means that I'm also a recipient of the grace of God. Now listen closely. If we only honor those that we think deserve it, then we are putting ourselves in the place of God and we are trying to measure up by our own goodness, by our own standard. What we're saying is, I am not as bad as so-and-so. Therefore, I deserve honor. This person is not as bad as that other person, and therefore I can honor this person, but I'm not going to honor that person. Well, you don't have that option because when you understand what the Bible teaches, all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. Is there a way for one person to be more wicked than the other? Of course there is, okay? Nobody's going to look at a person like Hitler and say, well, that he was... Uh, on the same level as a 10-year-old child. Well, nobody's going to say that. But the truth is, all of us are born separated from God. But the Bible is very clear that because we're made in the image of God, that we are to be honoring. Jesus honored people with love, but he never approved of their sin. If you'll notice, Jesus at times was shocking in what he would say to people. Do you remember the story about the woman at the well? And he knew that she had a need. Did Jesus go in there and lamb blast her for what she was doing? No, he did not. He, he, he told her. He said, um, you've been married five times and the man you're living with now is not even your husband. And she was shocked. She was like, I perceive that you are a prophet. And the fact is, Jesus, he called attention to her sin but he forgave her sin and he pointed her to the living water. And that's what you and I are to do. It doesn't mean that we go around approving of sin, but it means that we honor people as human beings made in the image of God. Honoring a person means to see him or her as created in the image of God and as a person for whom Jesus died. John three sixteen. for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. Whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. You say, well, how do I honor a person? Well, I believe you honor with your words and your attitude. I gotta be honest, 
uh, there have been times that I have not been honoring to other people with my attitude. You ever just get an attitude when you go out in public? You ever go and you go to Lowe's or Home Depot and you're trying to get a little help and it seems like that you know more about the store than they do <laughs> and uh, you get an attitude? I got to be honest, I can do that. I can be a little bit of a jerk at times, you know. I, I can be a little condescending at times. Well, let's just call that what the Bible calls it. That's sin. You don't need to do that. You say, well, you know, uh, they're not, it, it's customer no service, and they weren't giving me any service, so therefore, I do. You ever go to a restaurant? Well, I've been out with people that have done this. And you just lied in to the waitress that is serving you because your meal wasn't fixed like a king would expect, you know. And the truth is, I've seen people do this, and, and, and let me just kind of go off on a tangent a little bit here. Um, I know of people that have given a waiter or a waitress who make their living at what they do by serving people, I know one woman that left a seven cent tip one time. Please, please do not let them know that you go to this church if you do that. You see, here's the point, and, I, and, I, and I'm, I'm not trying to drift here, but we honor with our words and our attitudes and our actions. When you go out, be honoring. Don't be condescending. These are people that Jesus died for. I think the only exception, the only exception is when a person is an Alabama football fan. I do believe that God gives us special grace, and you can mock them, all right? So, now I'm not sure where that is in Scripture. Maybe I'm, maybe I'm getting off a little bit. But, uh, but we honor with our words and our attitude. We honor by sharing the gospel. Now, once again, if you're going to share the gospel, make sure that you're doing what you should do. Like I said, if you leave a seven-penny tip, don't leave a gospel track and say, hey, you know, here's, uh, here's something for you to think about coming to our church. No, no, don't do that. But we share the gospel, and it honors people. Malachi 2.10, don't all of us have the same father talking about God? Hasn't the same God created us? Why are we unfaithful to each other? And why do we dishonor the promise given to our ancestors? You know what the promise was? That through God's grace, he would provide a savior for the world. That was his promise. Redemption. Salvation. Making it a free gift for all of us. So God says uh, that we need to honor one another. We need to share the gospel. Honoring a person means to reject racism and prejudice. Uh, James 2.1, my friends, as believers in our Lord Jesus Christ, the Lord of glory, you must never treat people in different ways according to their outward appearance. That is an ungodly thing to do, but it's also totally diametrically opposed to the gospel. If you're a person that treats people differently based on how they look, the color of their skin, the culture that they come from, then the Bible is pretty clear. You are anti-gospel. You're being anti-Jesus Christ. That's not the way he wants us to live. Uh, James 2, 4, doesn't this discrimination show that your judgments are guided by evil motives? Um, Acts 17, 26, from one human being, he created all races of people and made them live throughout the whole earth. He himself fixed beforehand the exact times and the limits of the places where they would live. So God is the one that created us in his image. And the beauty of it, if you study the Bible, you know that we all came from one father and one mother, Adam and Eve. And so Technically, and I think literally, we're related. We're brothers and sisters, literally. We are brothers and sisters in Christ. And so God expects us to bring honor. 
And then here's the second thing. The image of God requires unity in the church. Uh, We just read from Psalm 133 about unity. Listen to Galatians 328, there's neither Jew nor Greek, there's neither slave nor free, there's neither male nor female, for you are all one in Christ Jesus. So when it comes to the church, not only must there be unity of purpose, there must be unity of people. There must be unity of our brothers and sisters in Christ, not based on the way we look, not based on the amount of money that we earn, not based on our outward appearance, because God says that heaven is going to be a little different than what some of us are used to. Listen to Revelation 5, 9 and 10, and they sang a new song saying, you are worthy to take the scroll and to open its seals for you were slain and have redeemed us by, uh, to God by your blood out of, listen, every tribe and tongue and people and nation and have made us kings and priests to our God and we shall reign on the earth. If you don't like diversity in the church, you're not going to like heaven at all. Because according to that, there's going to be people from every tribe and race and nation and tongue. And that's a glorious thing. And you say, well, why did God make so many differences in human beings? Well, I don't know the answer to that, but I do know that he's a a God who is very creative. I mean, if God created 300,000 species of beetles, wouldn't it stand to order that he would also have a little diversity when it comes to his human beings that he made? Of course. And, and, And here's the thing. This brings honor to God. And so uh, we are to understand that heaven will look like God's creation. Our goal is for the church to look like heaven. We want to be unified. And like I said, we already read Psalm 133, uh, and so I'm not going to read that again. But I do want to point to you from Scripture, maybe this is something you haven't thought of, of how that when the church began, in the book of Acts, that in a short period of time, God did something amazing. He took cultures that were very segregated. The Jewish people were very segregated. Most cultures throughout uh, the first century were very segregated. There was not a lot of appreciation or integration or really acceptance of people that were different. But in just a short time, I want to show you what God did. In Acts chapter 6, we have the first deacons in the church. Let me me just tell you a little bit about these guys. Stephen was a Hellenistic Jew immersed in the Greek culture. In other words, he was Jewish, but he didn't act like a Jew. He He acted like a Greek person, okay? So he came in, you could say, non traditional. Um, Philip was the man that witnessed to the Ethiopian eunuch. I've already told you about him. And here in the very beginning in the book of Acts, God took the revival from Jerusalem to Ethiopia, an African country, and a revival broke out. And millions, they say, were converted uh, to Jesus Christ. Um, Prochorus was a Greek-speaking Jew. Um, Nicanor was probably a soldier, we believe. So you got guys from all different cultures. Some were, they were kind of sophisticated. Some were working class. Timon was probably one of the 70 disciples that Jesus appointed. Uh, Parmenius, his name means steadfast and trustworthy. Don't you need some steadfast and trustworthy people in the church? Just people that are going to be steadfast and trustworthy. They're going to be there. And then uh, Nicholas was a convert. Listen to this. He was one of the seven deacons. He was a convert from paganism, and he was a Gentile. Now, wait a minute. This was in Jerusalem. The majority of the people that were being saved at the beginning were Jewish people. And, And they took a guy that was a Gentile. Not only was he a Gentile, he was a convert from paganism. And they made him a leader in the church. 
you go further in the book of Acts, Acts chapter 16. The first three converts in Acts chapter 16, this was when Paul began to do his missionary journeys. Uh, God began to take them away from just ministering in Jerusalem and to spread the gospel across the entire world. That's what God called us to do. But in Acts chapter 16, when this really began to happen, I want you to notice the first three converts that are mentioned in Acts chapter 16 were Timothy, a man of mixed race, who became the pastor, the senior pastor of one of the most influential churches in the first century, the church at Ephesus. Uh, the, The second convert was Lydia. She was a Macedonian woman And God began to use her in an incredible way to spread the gospel. And a Philippian jailer, a working man, a guy that uh, Lydia was wealthy. Timothy uh, was of mixed race. Uh, He became an incredible leader. Lydia became an incredible leader. And the Philippian jailer was a convert that was about to commit suicide when he got saved. And I want you to see that in the church, as it began, the first converts on these missionary journeys were an Asian, an African, and a Caucasian. What does that tell you about the gospel of Jesus Christ? What does that tell you about the church of Jesus Christ? That God wants us to be unified. Why? Because we're made in the image of God. And God loves everyone. Every race was reached. Every race was represented in church leadership. And not to love someone, no matter their culture, background, or race, is an affront to the gospel and a gross disobedience to the command of Jesus Christ to love one another. Well, let me close with this. The image of God requires reconciliation where possible. Did you know that it's possible for you to be reconciled? Maybe even if you've had the wrong attitude toward others. It is possible for you not only to receive forgiveness, but to be completely changed. I I won't call the person's name, but um, I would never embarrass them. But a man that got saved in our church, um, in his personal talks with me, he talks about that before he got saved, He was, and these are his words, that he was a racist. He didn't like people that weren't just like him. In fact, he was like, I was pretty bad. And God saved that man and redeemed him and forgave him. And today, I can just, and I won't tell you, he's no longer a member of our church, but I can just tell you this about him that he is a proponent of what the Bible teaches, how we ought to love one another. And I've seen him do it. This was a man that used to hate people that didn't look exactly like him. And now he embraces with the love of Jesus Christ, people from every race, every walk of life. What does that tell us? That God can redeem you if you've had the wrong attitude, if you had the wrong background. Listen to John 13, 34. So now I'm giving you a new commandment. Love each other just as I have loved you. You should love each other. That's what Jesus said. Colossians 3, 12. Be gentle, ready to forgive, never hold grudges. By the way, when you, it's possible that you've been wronged. In fact, in that, a, in that an understatement of the year, you've probably been wronged in your lifetime. There have been people that have mistreated you in your lifetime. Now, you can either choose to live as a victim and say, you know what, that's just who I am. It's never going to end. Or you can be who God has called you to be. You can believe in the gospel of Jesus Christ. And yeah, does that mean that everybody's going to respect you? Probably not. Uh, Does that mean that everybody's going to love you? No, there are a lot of people that don't follow Jesus and are not Christians and don't love God. There are even Christians that don't obey the word of God. Does it mean that everybody's going to respect you? No, it does not. But it does mean that you can live with the power of the gospel and the love of Jesus Christ flowing through your veins and you can change the way you treat others. 
He said, learn to forgive. You can either hold a grudge and be a victim, or you can embrace the gospel and be a victor. Your choice. Your choice. But he says, remember the Lord forgave you, so you must forgive others. Matthew 5, 24. First be reconciled to your brother and then come offer your gift. He's talking about worship here. You know, a lot of us, the reason we don't get something out of the worship service, the reason we don't get something out of church, maybe it's because we've got spite in our heart, an unforgiving spirit. Someone, maybe they've wronged you. Maybe they did something that you didn't like. But what happened is you've got spite in your heart. And Jesus said, before you come to worship, you want to get the most out of it? Get reconciled. That's what he says. And so that's up to us. 2 Corinthians 5, 18 and 21, it says, this is all from God who through Christ reconciled us to himself and gave, gave us the ministry of reconciliation. That's the call of the church. We are to reconcile. We are to share the gospel. We are to love one another because we're made in the image of God. And then he said, for our sake, he made him, talking about Jesus, to be sin who knew no sin so that in him, we might become the righteousness of God. I have absolutely no right to hold ill will in my heart to another person made in the image of God. Why? Because God sent Jesus to die in my place. He became sin for me so that I could become the righteousness of God. I, I have no choice but to honor others and to live in the way that God tells us to live. And when I do, I bring glory to God. Let me just close with this thought. In the book of Acts, you can read in chapter 2, that it says that they shared things together and there was all this stuff going on. It was an amazing thing that happened in the church. Here's what it said. And day by day, people were being added to the church. Day by day. By day, there were so many people getting saved. There were so many people coming to this fresh new gospel that they were preaching. There were so many people having their lives changed. There were so many people that were being radically changed and being filled with the love of God. And it was because they were together. That's what it says. They were together. And that is my challenge to you. That is my challenge to us as a church, that we embrace looking a little bit like heaven. When we started this church, Bonnie and Neil are back here. They were original members. They were in our uh, small group, our core group, and we started. One of the things that we said is that we want to look like heaven. That's what we prayed. And what we meant by that was that we would look like our community, that we would reach people from all races, that people that didn't go to church would be welcome to us, that we would live with open arms. That's why our mission statement is bringing people, wherever they are, into a growing relationship with Christ. We want to be a church of open arms, but we want to point people to Jesus because it ain't about us, friend. It's about him. Amen. Can I get an amen, church? Well, here's my question to you. What is God saying to you? Did he spark a little something in your heart? Did the Holy Spirit whisper something into your ear? Maybe it was something that you need to correct in your life, something you need to repent of. Maybe you've been mistreating others. Maybe it's something that confirmed something in your heart that you knew that God has called you to be a part of this and that it's just strengthen your commitment to Jesus Christ. Or, or, or maybe you're here today and you need to be saved. For those of you watching online, I would encourage you, if you need to receive Christ today, please, today's the day. Don't wait. Pray something like this. Dear God, I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. I believe that he died on the cross for my sins and rose from the grave. 
and I'm receiving you as my Savior today. Thank you in the name of Jesus for saving me. If you'll say something like that to God today, he promises to save you. If you're online, click, please click at the bottom of the screen so that we can help you take your next step. If you're new to our church or if you've just been coming for a while, but you've been playing church. Do you know what I mean when I say play in church? My wife, some of you don't know this testimony of my wife. My wife, her mom and dad were very faithful to a Baptist church in Jacksonville, Florida, where she grew up. Her dad was a deacon. Her mom was a Sunday school teacher. And when she was a little girl, she went forward. I believe the Spirit of God was convicting her, but nobody explained the gospel to her. And so when she went forward, they filled out a card. That's all they did. She didn't pray to receive Christ. She didn't know what it meant to be saved. And they baptized her. And from the time she got baptized, she thought she was a Christian. And the summer that she and I met, we were 18 years old. And uh, we were at a Christian camp in Wisconsin, of all places. And yes, I said Wisconsin, like a person from up there, all right? It's called Camp Shatek. And we were sitting out by the lake one afternoon, and I noticed Kim was sad. I said, what's the matter? I would not yet learned that there's not always a good answer to that question when you ask a woman that. But on this day, it was obvious she said, I don't think I'm saved. I said, what? Now, understand, she had played for a church and a choir from the time she was 15 years old. She traveled in a Christian singing group all across the nation telling people about Jesus. And she wasn't even a Christian. And on that day, I was able to hold her hand by that lake, and she prayed and received Jesus Christ in her life. Now, what do I mean when I say play in church? Maybe that's your story. Maybe you've been in church all your life. Maybe you've been in it for a long time, and you just, you know that maybe you've never truly been saved. And I don't, I don't say this kind of stuff often. I don't want people to doubt their salvation. But friend, I'd rather you pray to be saved twice and go to heaven than never to do it and go to hell. I promise you that, okay? Now, I don't believe you need to be saved multiple times. I believe that once you're saved, you're always saved, okay? But listen, maybe, maybe you're one of those people that have played church and it's time to stop. It's time to start anew. It's time to start with Jesus. And so today, maybe you're in that group that needs to be saved. I, I encourage you to see our prayer team after the service. Our prayer team will be over here. And whatever you need prayer for, maybe you need to be saved. Maybe you need to have people pray for your health. Maybe you need healing. Maybe there's some grudge you're holding. Maybe there's uh, something else going on. Maybe you have financial needs. Maybe you have family needs. Maybe you're having difficulty with your kids. It doesn't matter what it is. Our prayer team, these are people that I believe are filled with the Spirit of God. And they certainly have our blessing as a church. And I've talked with every one of these people, and I know them personally, and I believe they're there to pray for you. And they're there to help you. So if you want to pray with them after the service, they'll be over here to my left, to your right, on the way out. And they'll pray for you. So whatever your need is, I encourage you today to turn over to Jesus. And I believe that he will be there for you. Well, the good news is we're starting our small groups back this week. If your small group leader has contacted you and let you know when and where they're meeting and when they're going to start, uh, I encourage you to be a part of that. If you're not a part of a small group, in fact, Kim and I are having our small group today after church. Um, and we'll work around here for a little bit and then we'll go home and have some delicious lunch and we're gonna meet with our small group. Not all of them are here today, uh, but um, that's okay. We'll catch up next week. So 
whatever, if you're interested in being a part of a small group, you can let us know and we'll try to get you connected. Take your next step. We had our next step class today. We had two people join the church today in that wonderful church. Very excited about that. And we got others that are going to go through it and are ready to join the church. And so we're excited. Whatever your next step is, make sure you take it. Let's everyone stand together. Um, I've rambled on enough. Let's pray. Lord, thank you for this day. Thank you for this church. I pray that you bless us today. Help us to follow you with all of our hearts. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen.